is that the economists can sit at the tables of power. Uh, prior to that, the tradition of the Austrians was to respect spontaneous order. Uh, but of course, it's very seductive to sit at the tables of power. Uh, and uh, that's why people are sort of naturally drawn uh, to the idea uh, that uh, if only the experts were in power, they could rule. Ironically as well, uh, my own uh, influence was uh, from Noam Chomsky, whom some of you may have heard of. He's become quite internationally famous over the years. Chomsky actually is a, a left winger and very dour and sour on the whole subject of capitalism. But, uh, but he taught me uh, that uh, the experts wanted to rule foreign policy too. They wanted to remake the world in their own image. Uh, and uh, there too, I understood uh, that trusting the experts was never, never a good idea. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> Bleeding Heart Capitalism is the title that I imposed on uh, my little tale about having to talk to a socialist. Uh, I, in your case, I think you might have your own tales and your own ideas. I'm only going to humbly share with you my ideas. Uh, you can put people on the defensive. It's true that there's so many things you can say against socialism uh, that uh, you can put them at a loss for words. Uh, because the manifest evils and problems of socialism are quite, can become quite clear. And of course, especially uh, to people such as yourself who come from the tradition that you came from, an amazing overthrow, uh, amazing to us uh, in New York, I should say, in the United States in 1989, when, you, when, the, when the socialist communist government was overthrown. Uh, and so you must have had dialogues about this too. But in my case, uh, I think that it's really a matter of not putting people on the defensive, but trying to lay before them uh, the, 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 the idea that if they are passionate about helping the poor, which is more or less what honest socialists are animated by, an honest concern with, with, the, with the broad masses of people, uh, that you too are a bleeding heart, you too care, of, uh, uh, care about people having enough food in their stomachs and, enough, uh, and a roof over their head that's adequate and access to decent uh, medical care. You too care about this and you too want to point out, you especially want to point out that socialism, that, that socialism is not the way that capitalism is. Well, I'm going to start with a famous quote, uh, and uh, I think this is a bit attributable to George Bernard Shaw, who I didn't look it up, and it's, and it's uh, and kind of a paraphrase. Uh, perhaps you've heard it, the quip, the man who is not a socialist at 20 is a scoundrel. The man who remains a socialist at 40 is a fool. Uh, now, uh, that's fine uh, as far as it goes, uh, but we want to make uh, the point uh, that uh, you, uh, if you're not a socialist at 20, you're not at all a scoundrel. Uh, you may well be a bleeding heart. Uh, and uh, by bleeding heart, of course, I mean people who care about uh, the plight uh, of the broad masses of people, uh, the poor. Uh, now, uh, the gateway drug, uh, as I would put it, to uh, getting maybe high on capitalism, uh, would be the reason the bleeding heart supports free market capitalism, fervently supports free market capitalism, because it is essential to lifting the living standards <coughs> of the broad masses of people. Uh, really, in, in a way, the, the, the conventional story can be inverted. The elites more or less make do, they'll take care of themselves in, in almost any society, many elites will least, uh, the people who know how to cope uh, with, uh, with the complications of society. It's really the broad masses of people who are the ones who are given a chance under free market capitalism. Now, I want to get to uh, a, a, a formulation that I've taken from a very good, a very massive book by an economist, American economist named George Riesman, who was also influenced by Mises and also, in fact, sat in on Mises' seminar. He tries to address head on the doubts about how you cope when you have a job under free market capitalism. He writes, the Marxian doctrine of the alleged arbitrary power of employers over wages appears plausible because there are two obvious facts that it relies on, worker need and employer greed. Now notice he's talking about these as obvious facts. 
He's not denying that worker need and employer greed are facts. Uh, now, uh, what is worker need? Well, let's make sure we understand it. The average worker must work in order to live, and he must find work fairly quickly, because his savings can't sustain him for long. And if necessary, if he had no alternative, he would be willing to work for as little as minimum subsistence. Now, this is all valid. That's true. Uh, now, uh, what is that? And this is compounded by employer greed. Uh, Self-interest makes employers, like any other buyers, prefer to pay less rather than more, to pay lower wages rather than higher wages. Uh, all true. Uh, worker need and employer greed. Uh, but, uh, but these two things uh, do not prevent uh, the, uh, the worker from getting a market wage. Uh, and I'll, we'll of course define what we mean by a market wage. Uh, but uh, I want to tell uh, the Reisman's parable about the car seller, uh, a story that he hopes that I hope is plain enough anybody with any common sense, uh, remember the need and the greed. Uh, his, the story he tells is he moves to big city and you can't afford to maintain a car. Uh, how do you get the market price from greedy buyers who want to pay as little as possible? In other words, it's not just that you can't afford to, to, to support the car, it's actually that if you move the car to the city, the expense of garaging it uh, would, would, would turn it into a dead weight loss. It would actually cost you to keep maintaining the car so that, in fact, uh, it would be more profitable if you simply abandoned the car and perhaps with no money at all uh, because uh, it, would be, uh, it would be a cost rather than, it would be a liability rather than an asset. Well, he hopes to appeal to your common sense by, or the common sense of many socialists, by pointing out that even though the buyers are greedy, they want to pay as little as possible for the car, and even though you are needy, you'll actually dump the car, or even pay somebody to take the car off you for nothing. This is not at all the way you proceed. Uh, you're, uh, you're going to take the car, you'll look up, uh, you know, you're going to post the car for a going rate, you're going to look, you're going to take it to used car dealers, you'll find that, that there is a market price for the car, and you'll sell the car at the market price. And so you sell it at the market price because then, and that market price is more or less uh, a compromise between what people, the little, the little that people want to pay and, and their opportunity to get the car from you. So that, for example, while the buyers are greedy, if somebody uh, offers you $1,000 for the car, if somebody else offers you $1,200 for the car, the person who offers you $1,000 is going to lose out. That person won't get the car uh, at all. Uh, and so that person might have an incentive to offer you 1300 for the car, a better price than the 1200 uh, And so all he's trying to point out is that uh, just it, as in that situation where there's both need and greed, uh, you can still sell the car at the market price. Now, what does that depend on? That depends on, uh, on, on if you're a wage earner, it depends on the idea that there are plenty of employers, that there's more than one employer. There are, there are several employers out there for the kind of skills you have. Uh, human uh, labor is variable. You can, you can go to one employer or another. So the fact that you have the need for a job in order to eat, just as the fact that you have a need to get rid of this car, uh, is not going to determine the outcome. Uh, so that's a employer need and, uh, and buyer greed. Uh, and uh, th this is a point that I already mentioned, uh, that uh, that, that in a way, buyer greed is not even the issue. Buyers and employers want to pay the lowest price or lowest wage, but that price or wage must be high enough to outbid any other buyer or employer. Again, if the employer wants you, uh, wants your services, uh, then it has to be uh, at, a, at, at, a, at a price that, uh, that outbids all the other employers. Uh, and so that if there's a market for cars, then, uh, then, then let's. Then, then we, we might acknowledge. Well, it's very demeaning to say there's a market for your labor. Doesn't that de dehumanize you in a certain way? Let's let's concede that point for the moment. But all it, all it's, uh, all that we are trying to point out here is that need and greed do not impede the fact that in a in a market where there are many buyers and sellers, uh, need and greed uh, are not dominant. 
uh, it's actually the market price that is dominant in a correct in a in a, uh, in a in a reasonably functioning market. Uh, now, some other uh, uh, modifications of that. This is somewhat more important. I'm taking this from a from a uh, from a very good article about labor unions in the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics. Uh, what's the next iteration of this? The next step to understand how wages are, are determined. A powerful employer cannot depress labor prices below the value of workers' financial contribution for long because other firms are attracted by the cheaper labor. The new firms hire these workers and thereby put upward pressure on the prices paid to labor until further profit from the initial exploitation of isolated labor disappears. A further uh, cor uh, corrective me mechanism. If employer cloud depresses wage rates in one location, so labor supply will decrease as mobile workers leave, again putting corrective upward pressure on wage rates. Uh, further, even the historical image of corporate power dominating isolated company mining towns is mostly fiction. 19th century Appalachian coal miners, for example, were highly mobile and literally hundreds of companies competed in the same coal and labor market in both company-owned and independent towns. Uh, finally, because labor is the most versatile and flexible input, it is much harder for owners of large fixed capital investments to exploit labor rather than for labor unions uh, uh, to exploit uh, business investors. Uh, labor unions have more clout. Uh, then furthermore, now this has become an important sticking point in terms of the US history, uh, labor unions actually foster inequality. Uh, they, uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, it, there's been many articles about the rise of inequality in the US. Uh, I decry inequality to the extent that it's due to crony capitalism, that it's the extent that it's due to government subsidizing rich corporations and rich capitalists. And that, of course, is a very important phenomenon in the US uh, for sure. Uh, but it's often argued that the decline of labor unions in the U.S. has, has contributed to inequality, uh, when in fact, the labor unions help foster inequality. One of the critical problems with even arguing that in the U.S. the decline of labor unions has fostered inequality is that the decline of labor union representation actually began in the U.S. in the early 1950s. It began so many, it began at a time when there were, when in fact, the, the inequality in the U.S. had not increased. Uh, for, uh, in, in the early, from 1950 to 1970, inequality uh, in the U.S. was approximately stable. So it, it, it falls apart empirically to talk about the decline of labor unions being a cause. But in fact, uh, in terms of the dynamics of the market, as this economist pointed out, labor unions foster inequality because the late wage advantage enjoyed by union members result, results from two factors. First, monopoly unions raise wages above competitive levels. Second, non-union wages fall because workers priced out of jobs by high union wages move into the non-union sector and bid down wages there. Thus, some of the gains to union members come at the expense of those who must shift to lower paying or less desirable jobs or go unemployed. Um, we could talk about that some more uh, when we have questions. Now, uh, it then, I think, becomes useful uh, to talk about the ironic uh, tribute to capitalism from Karl Marx himself, uh, a writer you probably have heard of. Uh, I'm quoting from the Communist Manifesto, which he co-wrote uh, with uh, Friedrich Engels. Uh, he's writing about the bourgeoisie, because bourgeoisie really means capitalism. Uh, the bourgeoisie, and I'm italicizing certain words uh, because they're important, the bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. The chief prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. Well, those two phrases that I italicize the rapid improvement of all instruments of production. Well, that rapid improvement under entrepreneurial capitalism, once it's unleashed, it vastly increases supply. And then notice he's talking about the cheap prices of its commodities. 
Well, if prices become cheap, who does that benefit? Uh, that benefits the broad masses of people. Uh, and there, uh, it leads us to the insight, which I'm going to elaborate on even further, uh, the insight that uh, that, that, the, that the living standards are mainly lifted by the broad masses of people on the supply side. Uh, the, the wages that, that remain market wages are not going to enrich people uh, unless supply increases, uh, unless uh, there are, you know, there is rapid improvement of all instruments of production, unless the cheap prices of, 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 of the commodities of capitalism are the heavy artillery with which we batter down the old Chinese walls. Uh, that's the phenomenon of capitalism that lifts the way, lifts, lifts the living standards of the broad mass of the people. A further quote from Marx, the bourgeoisie has sub subjected uh, the country to the rule of the towns. It has created enormous cities, has cre greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rural, and has thus rescued considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. Uh, Marx had been raised on a farm and clearly he thought it was an idiotic way to live. That was his view, uh, not necessarily everyone's. Uh, but again, uh, this is from uh, you know, the, uh, the, the staunch communist, the staunch enemy of, of capitalism. And uh, it's a grudging tribute uh, to what goes on under, under capitalism. Uh, Again, I'm picking on, uh, up on, on two uh, of the phrases, that rise in living standards come from cheap prices, and virtually all the great fortunes in the U.S. were made in the U.S., I'm only talking about the country I know well, were made by selling goods and services to the masses, from Steve Jobs to Sam Walton of Walmart to Henry Ford of Ford Motor Company. Uh, it all happened, wages are market wages, but it all happens on the supply side. And then when Marx talked about driving people out of the cities, he was talking about the usual history by which productivity rises, by which all of the cheap means of production uh, uh, increases productivity. But the usual uh, consequence of rising productivity is layoffs and creative destruction. We're now getting into the turmoil that capitalism produces, but, but Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, the economist, called it creative destruction, because even though it destroys, on balance, it massively creates and lifts people out of poverty. The really two forces are that rising productivity on the farm drive work, drives workers on, from the farm to the factory. The thing to confront uh, is, that, is that when an industry in, in, uh, enjoys, I'm using that term enjoys in quotes, it enjoys rising productivity. Uh, when, in the case of the United States, 50% of the people were producing food uh, for the other 50%, and now in the United States, 1% of the people work on the farm and producing food for the other 99%. Uh, that, that other, and producing far more food than ever before with just that 1%. Then that causes disruption. Uh, if you're in an industry that has rising productivity, actually, it's not necessarily to your benefit. It's really those who are consuming the product uh, that, uh, that, that are benefited. The broad masses of people who are enjoying and buying the cheap food uh, are the beneficiaries. It's not the workers on the farm, because the workers on the farm then have to go elsewhere and they move from farm to factory. Now, the process that at least the US economy is especially undergoing, and that's noticeable, and that's decried by so many, is that rising productivity in the factory is driving workers from the factory to the office. Uh, to service the sector. Now that happens as well, but so much, so much of the debate about the rising prosperity uh, that capitalism brings only talks about the worker side of the equation. It does not recognize that workers are also and fundamentally consumers, and that uh, that whatever and, and that if a particular industry is hurt, of course, obviously capitalism in that industry are hurt uh, by, 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 by competition. When the horse and buggy industry had to shut down because the auto industry took over, workers in the horse and buggy industry had to 
go to Detroit to work for those five, that $5 a day wage that at that time Henry Ford was offering that was double the wage of wherever else they could go. So it cr does create a turmoil. But of course, it's also not good news for the capitalists who, uh, who run that horse and buggy industry. That is indeed creative destruction. But without creative destruction, uh, society would be permanently impoverished. Uh, and uh, so that too is something we must confront we must understand that creative destruction is essentially all about the workers as consumers. Uh, now that too, maybe that's a tough sell, but if, but if you're gonna stay on the farm and, 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 and subject, subject yourself, as Mark said, to the idiocy of rural life, the poverty that often persists in rural areas that persisted, for example, in Appalachia, I'm told that there's poverty, uh, poverty in the countryside in Romania, uh, then that transition must be made. And transitions are not always unpleasant. Transitions, for many of us, can be somewhat exciting, somewhat uh, creative in our lives. Well, um, now, uh, about productivity uh, and, and, and the consequence of productivity, let me fall back on a, an amusing story about Milton Friedman, who was a, a famous free market economist that visiting a work site in Asia where a new canal was being built, he was surprised that the workers uh, had shovels rather than modern tractors and earth movers. Uh, and he, uh, he was told, you don't understand, explained a government bureaucrat, this is a jobs program, mm -hmm. to which Friedman responded, that you should give these workers spoons, not shovels. Uh, and uh, that is indeed uh, the implication of uh, those people uh, who object uh, to greater productivity. But of course, if the workers were given uh, modern tractors and earth movers, fewer workers would be required uh, to do that job. And uh, that's, of course, ultimately, the way in which uh, the standard of living of the broad mass of the people is raised uh, through, cap through the substitution of, 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 of capital for labor, so that fewer and fewer workers are required to perform certain tasks, and they're then freed up to perform other tasks, and to perform more creative tasks. Uh, and certainly, the history of work under capitalism is that work becomes a less in the way of drudgery, more creative, more challenging to the mind and the heart, less alienating over time uh, by, by giving people shovels and not spoons, and by giving people modern tractors and earth movers uh, rather than shovels. Well, uh, that's the story of wages, productivity, consumption in a nutshell. Uh, can you talk to a socialist this way? I hope so. I'm going to deal with a couple of other issues. Uh, and, but first, update the saying. Uh, the man who is not a socialist in 20 understands that social, socialism brings impoverishment and tyranny. Uh, he sees free market capitalism as the only system known to man that can bring prosperity and freedom. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have to deal with inequality uh, under capitalism. Uh, we could put, again, we could put the socialists on the defensive and point out that inequality uh, is probably worse under socialism. Uh, certainly, based upon what I have read, I never quite lived under uh, severe socialism, but certainly uh, when you read about how uh, the elites uh, of the party in, uh, in, in, in Moscow uh, went to special stores that were closed to the broad masses of people. I mean, that's true <coughs> inequality. You know? At least you could walk into the stores that rich people go to. At least you could walk into most of them. Uh, and rich people and poor people often go to the same stores uh, under capitalism. They're often buying the same things. Uh, but again, you put a socialist on the defensive, yeah, you'll win the argument. Uh, for the moment, you'll win the argument, but I think you'll lose the war, you'll lose the, the intellectual war, because you never benefit by putting people on the defensive. Uh, because in the back of their mind, they're gonna say, well, you know, but, but capitalism doesn't work either, you know, so. But we try to point out in this story about work and need, greed, productivity, how, it, how consumption uh, works, that indeed, anybody who wants to work under capitalism, and of course, this gets into another issue of people who don't work under capitalism, uh, uh, but anybody who wants to work under capitalism uh, will find that his, his or her standard of living rate rises. 
But with respect to inequality, uh, I was speaking to my friend Camille about different ways of attacking this, the subject of inequality, and there are many ways. My preference is to simply ask you to take a choice, the inequality riddle, uh, which is uh, the choice between uh, option A and option B, that the top 1% increase their income by 50%, and the bottom 99% increase their income by 30%. Now, that obviously brings more inequality. Uh, between the 1% and the, uh, and the 99%. Uh, but it does mean that the 99% are experiencing a substantial increase in their standard of living. Uh, and that, by the way, is what I believe has happened by and large over the last 30, 40 years in the US. Uh, that indeed everyone's standard of living has increased even though inequality has increased. Uh, but then there's option B. The top 1% suffer a decrease in income by 50%. And the bottom 99% suffer a decrease of 30%. That, uh, that, that diminishes inequality. Uh, then the gap between the rich and the poor is narrower, except everyone ends up poorer. And if you're going to choose option B, uh, then uh, nobody can contradict you. If you want everyone to be dragged down uh, because uh, of envy, as I would say, uh, I don't want to put Socialist on the defensive, but I would say you are succumbing to envy, uh, then, uh, then uh, that's your choice. Uh, that's what you want. Uh, but at least, hopefully, these options make it clear that perhaps inequality isn't, uh, isn't the real problem. The real question is raising everyone's standard of living, and, uh, and, and whether you raise the rich by more or the poor by more, it matters less than that everyone is better off. Uh, that would be the primary idea. Now, I want to just touch on something that I, uh, that I went into at some greater length the other night, uh, what is called public choice theory, politics without romance. Uh, if we then have brought our socialists to an understanding that, uh, that capitalism lifts the standard of living of the broad masses of people, uh, and, uh, and does so mainly on the consumption side by maintaining market wages, at a market level, but then by flooding the market with all the fortunes that are made through mass production, through increased productivity, by moving people from the farm to the factory, and from the factory to the office. Uh, then, uh, then one question remains about the role of politics, and public choice theory, uh, which uh, I believe primarily came, came from a number of American economists, has been called politics without romance. It simply says the following. Uh, that uh, those who believe in politics with romance, uh, of whom there are many, there are many even those who still would worship uh, Barack Obama, our president, as a transcendent president, a great guy, a real statesman, all of the rest. Uh, they believe in politics with romance. They believe that, uh, that when you take a person, when a person runs a business, he's strictly self-interested and selfish. He's strictly profit-oriented. Well, I, I have met a number of businessmen, uh, from John Mackey to Whole Foods, who simply love the product that they sell, who believe in the product that they sell. In John Mackey's case, he believes in selling healthy food, although he has to concede that he's got to succumb to the, to the wishes of some of his consumers and sell some food that he himself wouldn't buy. And he even has said publicly, I hope you stop buying that stuff. It's just that I'm offering it, because otherwise I'd go bankrupt if I didn't. A lot of businessmen I have met are idealists. Uh, they not only love what they do, uh, they, they also, when they make a lot of money, they start giving it away. It's all, uh, so these people uh, are admirable people. Uh, now, of course, there are lots of businessmen who are always focused on, on their own selfish self-interest. But all that public choice theory asks you uh, to, uh, to doubt is this magical idea that when you take uh, this same person and turn him into a politician, suddenly he becomes a selfless uh, uh, person who wants to promote the public interest. That he's not, as in most cases, in, uh, self-interested. Mainly, politicians are interested and good at getting reelected. That's their talent. That's what they know best. Uh, you can't expect very much more of them. Uh, bureaucrats, in my case, by the way, I looked briefly for a city bureaucracy when I was in my 20s, and that was quite an experience. I just began to recognize the obvious fact that, that they are basically self-interested, just like most people are. There are 
ideas and good people in all sectors, but of course, a businessman who's selling the product that he knows best uh, is the best person to, to offer that product, because that's his expertise. Consumers who are consuming that product, they will spend time uh, finding out whether the product is good enough, because that's in their self-interest to do so. People are not motivated to follow politics, because their ability to follow the complexities of politics First of all, it's usually beyond them, and secondly, it's not rational, it doesn't pay off because their ability to affect, to affect the outcome is not very good. So when you compare the political solution to the free market solution, you find that the free market solution both, both attracts idealists just as much as the political solution does, and because of its very nature, the free market solution concentrates every mind, everyone's mind wonderfully so that they can do what they do best and actually achieve something. Well, that's politics without romance. Uh, and finally, just to summarize uh, some other part of it, which is that free market capitalism <laughs> is essential to liberty. Uh, that's, uh, that's the other part of it. But I, uh, my impression is that most socialists care about prosperity more than they care about liberty, although many of them also care about liberty. And that's when the government controls the means of production, liberty is curtailed even with the best of intentions. If the government owns the printing press and owns the computers and owns all our means of communicating with each other, then it's gonna to have to allocate those goods and services because there's always scarcity and there will inevitably be uh, ways in which the government will control our ability to operate our businesses freely, our, 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 to communicate with each other freely. Uh, libertarian socialism, that's what uh, Noam Chomsky called himself, a libertarian socialist. It's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. That's another issue. Uh, but the main issue is that you can be a bleeding heart and be, be a capitalist. Indeed, uh, the only way to be a bleeding heart is to be a capitalist. Now comes the best part of the talk, your questions, your discussions. You'll tell me how you can talk to a socialist, and I'd be fascinated to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epstein, for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, please, uh, as far uh, as I learned being a journalist, the worst questions are the ones that are never addressed to the speaker. The worst questions? Yeah. Okay. So please, uh, I see uh, young people here in the room. I'm sure that you have good questions for Mr. Epstein, but first, uh, Mr. Kamil, you have the floor. Yeah. Okay. 